All right, back on Young Turk's 21st birthday uh, slash anniversary. I don't know what to call it, but uh, Jake Uger, Senator Ian Turner, Dr. Rashad Ritchie. Uh, it's not a power panel, yes, but it looked like one. Uh, <laughs> That's right. So, uh, guys, great to have you here, uh, both tonight and at the network. Uh, couldn't be more proud. Uh, so, what we're going to do uh, in in each segment, we got fun little things to do. And here, uh, I'm I'm going to ask you guys what was the moment that turned you into a TYT fan. But before we get to that, I want to tell you guys the moment that I became fans of you. Um, so <laughs> I'll start with Rashad. So we had Rashad on the conversation. Now, like, oh, he's good. And I remember talking to Judith, our head of programming, and I was like, let's let's get him on more shows. Then he goes, this is in 2020. Uh, then he goes on uh, Damage Report with John. Oh, so he's good. Okay. Uh, then on election night in 2020, he joins as a guest host. And I think that's the first time that I said it, but I've said it many times since then, where Rashad made a point where I was like, oh, wow, I hadn't thought of that at all. Damn, that's a good point. And so then we had him on more and more until, of course, he became a host. But Rashad, uh, man, you are. I mean, from day one, you were about as impressive as I have ever seen any guest we've ever had on here. Uh, so my hat's off to you. Um, and now, Thank of course, you, Rashad has won about 28 awards, hottest new show in <laughs> media. Uh, it's got. If you think he's got a lot of awards, you should see his degrees. Uh, so <laughs> and uh, Fulton County, where Atlanta is, is named a day after him. So uh, amazing. Now I'm gonna get to Nina's story in a second. But Rashad, um, uh, what was the what was the moment where you thought TYT? Hmm. Let me tell you, man. And I was trying, and thank you for all of that complimentary uh, sentiment. I know it comes from the heart with you. Don't know if I'm deserving of it, but thank you for it. I remember, man, and like I'm I'm thinking today. I'm like, what was he talking about? But it was you, Jank. And I don't remember the topic. But this was about two years before you did the thing at MSNBC. And I was always a passive um, watcher, a man who was very appreciative of the policy angle. But you got so angry at, at an adverse policy. And I'm embarrassed that I don't remember what the policy was, that you damn near threw your voice out um, talking about it. And that kind of passion, insight, and intellect connected to why the policy was bad, that is what did it for me. And I've always embraced my humanity as someone who reports on the news. I've worked and still work for some traditional news outlets as a commentator. And I've never, I've never thought I needed to back away from my humanity in a story, never. And a part of that is directly attributed to how you deliver the news, dear brother. So that's what it was for me, man. That's what made me a fan of TYT. Yeah, that's amazing. And you know, I'm not used to it, right? So I remember when you told me, no, I've been watching TYT a long time. I was like, really? I'm like, he's so yep. good and he's been watching us. Hmm. Okay. I play your clips on my radio <laughs> show. Yes. That's amazing. <laughs> All right, we're going to give you early Rashad. Uh, Moment in a second, okay. But I want to go to Nina. Okay, so Nina, um, so I'm gonna do the same story with you, and I think you know this one. So I, at this point, I already know Nina Turner. She's already um, working on Bernie Sanders' campaign back in 2016, and and she's uh, already had the courage to come over the Bernie Sanders side. And if people don't remember, back in 2015, 2016, that was a lot of courage. Almost no one had done that. In fact, one of the reasons Nina stood out in the beginning for everyone else was they're like, oh my God, there's another Democrat that supports Bernie Sanders. <laughs> it was like breaking news. And so, but it wasn't then. I watched a, a, a speech that she had given. Nina, I don't remember if it was Netroots or where it was. I don't know if you remember. Uh, but I, do you remember where it was? I do. It was the, it was the People Summit. Oh, people summon. Do you remember what year it was? That was in 2016. 2016. Okay. So yeah. Nina Nina's giving a speech and she's up at the uh, on stage, right? And folks are uh, down below. And all of a sudden she walks off the camera and I'm like, 
Where'd she go? I never see that in my life, right? She went to go talk to the crowd, within the crowd. And I was like, wow, okay. And the camera tries to find her and then eventually the camera finds her. And then uh, she she takes a 12 year old girl, I don't know if she's 12, but a young girl and, and says, yeah. gives a speech about how we're not gonna let her down. She's been let down too many times and we're not gonna let her down, okay? And I was like, Wow, and but I'm like I'm already like blown back, and then she says, you know, sometimes I get called an angry black woman, and she's like, damn right I'm angry, and I was like, yes, yes, I found it. <laughs> okay, I found the person who's who's the star, who's amazing at this. So Nina, uh, what's your recollection of that speech and, and and our interaction? And remember, I just saw it online yeah. in the beginning. I mean, you are bringing back so many memories. I mean, you actually sent me an email dissecting the entire speech of which I still have your email. And similar to what Dr. Ritchie said, it really, it was you. I mean, to see the level of passion and compassion and you delivering the news uniquely to your personality, that doesn't happen on mainstream media because you're supposed to be all hoity toity and prim and proper. And it just blew me away to see you on TYT show all that emotion. It was, I mean, you were you speaking my love language because that's that's how I roll too. And that is what attracted me to TYT. So in the black church, when the preacher has given the sermon, we just say amen. And Dr. Richie laid out everything I was going to say about you. You are magnetic and it is your magnetism. People know that you are genuine, even if they don't always agree with your political points or your policy direction. They know that you are being uniquely who you are. And that is something that is very attractive. And people need that. They want genuineness and they want authenticity in this moment. And it is rare, again, especially in media, because you got to be so. And, and that's what I love about TYT, because when I was able to come on and first being interviewed, I'm saying, wow, I could be totally, almost totally myself. You don't want to see the whole 100%. <laughs> I got the whole something back. <laughs> but I can be seventy five percent myself. It is just a beautiful, beautiful platform, and we are blessed to have it. I mean, every day on my show, I say to people, "Thank you for supporting Unbossed, and thank you for supporting the TYT Network." All right, that's beautiful, and um, and thank you, Nina. Uh, thank you to both of you guys. So, and you guys know the rundown, right? Damage report, then indisputable, Doctor Rashad Ritchie. Uh, then you got on boss with Nina Turner. Then you got watch this with J.R. Jackson. He'll be on a little bit. And then you got the Young Turks, okay, with me and Anna. So, um, uh, Nina, it's it's funny because mainstream media, we've all had experiences with it, right? Um, wants you to be in a box, right? And they want you to act in a certain way. Whereas I thought I'm looking for people who are not in that box, who are not acting in a way that others want. But acting in a way that they want, because what that shows me is strength. That shows me strength of character, strength of will, right? And that's one hundred percent what I saw in both of you. And I thought this this is the answer, right? And and for now in media, it is the answer and is proven to be the answer, right? But stay tuned. You never know. A lot more to come, right? <laughs> in terms of what it could be. Uh, but I love that you you didn't listen to the rules. Uh, so uh, every consultant in the world will tell you, don't say you're angry, don't say you're angry. Uh, it's wrong, it's wrong. People want uh, people that are genuine and human uh, like you are, Nina. So in fact, let's go to one of uh, Nina's uh, first appearances on TYT. I haven't seen these clips either, so let's watch. This is Johnny Rolla for the Young Turks at the Democratic Unity Reform Commission meeting. We're speaking with Nina Turner. You will see a lot of chatter, particularly on social media, you know, condemning people for lifting their voice about differences that they may have about the Democratic Party. Some of those people, I believe the overwhelming majority of those people, want to make this party stronger, want to make it the party of the people. And so unity doesn't mean that just people just fall in line. Unity also means critique. All right, we're here with Senator Nina Turner. It's become a little bit of a ritual after the debates. Uh, we 
much do this every time. We gotta keep it going. There's a study out that says that it would take 228 years for the average black family to catch up to the wealth of the average white family if we stay on this course, if nothing changes. What that means is that it's never going to happen, that black people are being resigned to a future that says that we are never going to have wealth in this country. And that it doesn't matter if your parents have a college degree or whether or not your parents are wealthy or not. If you are black in this country, that wealth that was made on the blood, sweat, the backs of chattel slavery in this country can never be undone. And you got a vice president that was totally, just, just totally numb to that. I'm looking at my eyes in that early interview, right? And my eyes are like, whoa, yes, yes, right? Or as the kids would say these days, yes, queen. Uh, <laughs> 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 so just uh, everything uh, you said there in space. So I, I, Rashad, I'm gonna go to one of your clips in a sec. But Nina, I did wanna ask you one more question about those days. Do you, do you remember yeah. what it was about Bernie Sanders that made you flip and go, oh, yeah, that's the guy when no one else believed? Yeah, I mean, first of all, didn't think anybody else was going to run, you know, so that's number one. But then the C, Senator Bernard Sanders, stepped to the plate. And when he talked about two specific things, touched my heart with him. One is about college for all, and that is because I am a first generation college graduate. And but for that opportunity, I don't know where I would be today. Having people believe in me and being able to start off at a community college, which oftentimes students of color in particular do very well starting off at a community college first. And then secondly, and not necessarily in this order, when he talked about Medicare for all, you know this story, Jenkins, and I think Dr. Richie knows it too, but my mom died at a very young age. She was only 42 years old, a blood and a brain aneurysm. And so to hear this man stand up there and talk about universal health care in this country and what it would mean to save lives, to give people peace of mind and enhance their quality of life, I saw my mama through that lens. And those two things primarily attracted me to Senator Bernard Sanders. All right, that makes a lot of sense. All right, Rashad, let's show an early clip of a, a, an appearance that you had on TYT. Let's watch. Rashad Ritchie uh, is was actually one of the best talk radio personality in Atlanta by the Atlanta uh, Journal Constitution, which is pretty badass. Okay, Rashad, I get it, you're fired. Uh, yeah, man, I'm that dude. <laughs> you're that dude. <laughs> I teach college students of all races. I tell them that is more like white preference, where white preference says we will give you preferential treatment because of the color of your skin. Everybody knows that if it was a 25 year old white male jogging through that community, this would not have happened. Seven days after the assassination of King, they signed that landmark civil rights bill that he had been fighting damn near his entire adult life to get passed. Why did they do that? It wasn't because they were remorseful over the death of Dr. King, it was because the seven days between his assassination to the signing of that bill, 110 cities in the United States of America rioted. That is a statement of fact. You know, it, it's interesting because I, I already got something really productive out of this conversation. You made a great point there. You seem very well prepared, certainly more Of course, why, why would I not be well prepared? You know, you've bombarded well, me Let me drop some facts on you, Rob. Enough. You're kind of bloviating now, filibustering. So let me drop okay. some facts on you. Individuals who are unarmed, should not be killed by the police if the cop's life is not in danger. That's period. Black Lives Matter is a grassroots advocacy movement. And yes, there is a grassroots advocacy organization. The reality is they bring attention and awareness to issues that are systemic and connected to prejudicial treatment of racism in this too. country. Now, now hold on, brother. Say that again. This is, this is word, it's word too. Okay. Okay. I mean, there's so many great parts of that. One, <laughs> the conservative going, that was a lot of words. <laughs> right. <laughs> and Rashad, I gotta it's be honest. Debate. I gotta be honest, brother. We looked younger just three years ago. <laughs> <I know. laughs> right. But you mean as well. You look good. You look mature now. Me, well, okay. Right. But <laughs> right. anyways. Um, 
time, like a fine wine. There you go. Yeah, that's how it's supposed to work. <laughs> well, some sort of wine. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I remember now that that I think that might have been the first appearance, the one in, in June uh, 2020. When you said that the riots helped pass the bill, that was another moment where I was like, nobody says that. But that's definitely true, but nobody ever has the courage to say that. I was like, oh, this guy's different. And we like different, <laughs> okay, and bold and courageous and honest. So, um, all right. And so, all right, Rashad, how's it been since? Okay, so you come on, you know, you watch the show before, you do a couple of appearances. And then what's been your experience since then? First of all, let me say this. Um, I love it. I love it. Um, 100%. And a lot of it has to do with the, the response I received from the audience um, with my first few appearances. I'm doing John's show, I'm coming on the conversation. We're having these um, great opportunities to profess truth. And the audience, I mean, goodness, the love that they showed. Now, remember, at this time, I'm working at uh, CBS News Atlanta. I'm still their political commentator. I'm doing some hits with Fox News, debating Tucker Carlson, and sometimes on MSNBC in the morning time. I did MSNBC for about a year and a half every Sunday morning at about 6 a.m. There's a different, there's a different response there because I have to be offensive to everybody at some point. It's required when you have a policy directive rather than a partisan directive. And when you have a policy directive, you cannot avoid offending all parties at some point in your commentary, right? And Jenk, you said something really interesting about authenticity and media. I think it goes even deeper than that. I think it permeates to everyday lifestyle. I think authenticity should be who we are and authenticity wins. It happens that I'm in the media profession, right? So I give two examples of authenticity winning even in mainstream media. Number one, when I first started at CBS News Atlanta as their political commentator and political analyst, it sent shockwaves through Atlanta because I'm Mr. Opinion. I'm Mr. Aggressive, I'm rough around the edges, but I just got hired by this major local news station to do commentary. And sometimes I was able to do commentary nationally for CBS throughout the country. So what happened in that first year? The first year, the news director said to me, uh, Dr. Richie, no matter what you do, do not change who you are. That one person had an opinion contrary to that of the corporate managers. And he made a move, an affirmative statement to make sure I knew that he had my back, right? Um, so I do my thing. And yes, I'm rough around the edges. Yes, I show emotion. But within uh, that first year, I get Emmy nominated. And I become the first political analyst in the history of CBS News Atlanta to get an Emmy nomination. And that was just one of those points in my life where I realized this is not just about uh, delivering content. This is about delivering content with heart, with authenticity. And if you're upset, you're just upset. And if you gotta call something out, you call it out. And there was another opportunity where I'm doing a debate live TV. It's the big Atlanta mayoral debate. They give me a bunch of questions to ask that have been vetted by I don't know who, probably the campaigns. And I'm on the microphone next to a very seasoned news anchor. And she says, where are your questions? I said, madam, they are up here in my mind. She says, well, they gave you questions to ask. I said, I know. She said, so what are you going to do? I said, I'm gonna ask the questions that my community would like me to ask. She said, "Oh boy, they're not gonna like that. I said, ma'am, we're on live TV, what are they gonna do, take me off air? <laughs> so it was that, and then at the end of it, the news director calls and says, that was out of sight. I did not ask one question that told me I had to ask. Authenticity makes room for you in this life beyond just media. It makes room for you in everyday life. Sometimes we aren't comfortable enough to be our authentic selves because the world tells us who we really are is not good enough for the world we live in. I do not believe that whatsoever. 
So, so that's part of it. Okay, uh, it's amazing how similar the three of us are. Okay, and because here I'll tell you two stories, it's just like Rashad's. Uh, one is um, at MSNBC, I go and I'm a host now, and I've got like six, seven, eight different producers. And on the first day, uh, the, my executive producer panics because we're about to go on air like in an hour or something, which is no big deal, right? But to them, that's like really close to showtime. Uh, and he's like, Cenk, there's a huge problem. There's no questions written in the prompter for the guests. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I know. I didn't, they're in my head. And he's like, what? They can't be in your head? Are they really in your head? <laughs> he never seen that in his life. I'm like, yeah, I brought the guy on for a reason. I got all these questions I wanna ask him. I don't need to put it in the prompter. What am I gonna read them? I know what the questions are, I'm just gonna ask them. And he'd never seen that before. So I was nearly, I, you know, very similar to the story told. And Rashad, one time I'm gonna go to, a, a, I got a radio spot. It's just a tryout, it's down in Florida. Uh, and the guy says, okay, he gives me all these rules. I think every rule is nonsense. And he says, but whatever you do, do not talk about your personal life. Nobody cares about you, okay? And I thought, right now the number one uh, host on radio is Howard Stern. All he ever does is talk about himself, right? Yep. This is total utter nonsense. So I knew that he wasn't gonna hire me if I did this. But this is my point about you and about how we're similar. We can't help ourselves. Yep. So I went I on and did two straight hours of a personal story, a story of where I had tremendous personal disappointment and I wanted to share it with the audience and tell them it's okay, we're all gonna make it. Cuz I know you had one too, right? Yep. I had a guy who was a, a guy at the office who was like a frat board kind of guy, you know, gave off Republican vibes and stuff. This is Florida. He, so program director calls me afterwards, he's like, I guess you're a moron. Uh, no, you, you're not getting this job. <laughs> I told you not to talk about your life and that's all you did, right? Uh, and But the frat boy guy comes the next day on Monday and goes, I, I listened and brother, I cried. I cried listening to that. And so what I'm telling the audience now is the same thing I said back then, which is give them what you got, okay? Mm. That's exactly how Rashad got here. That's exactly how Nina got here. They didn't give people what other people had. They gave them what they had, okay? And that's what I respect about Rashad and Nina. Um, so uh, I'm thrilled that you're here uh, with us. All right, look, before we go back to Nina, um, I, I wanna read a couple of comments here about you guys uh, from our members. Biden Flavor Corn Park wrote in, I started really paying attention to Nina Turner after my white former brother-in-law said she irritated him. <laughs> I love that one. Um, and then added, you go, Nina, girl, bold, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. All right, now Rainbow Bright wrote in and said, I really want to thank both Nina and Dr. Ritchie for constantly speaking up for the LGBTQ community. Um, and said, black LGBTQ, we don't have any people from the black community that stands for us like they do. I wish we had one million Nina Turners and Dr. Richie's. Thank you both from an older black LGBTQ. Bless you. Thanks. Yeah. That's so sweet. Yeah, and so we fight for someone who isn't us. That's the whole yeah. point of progressives, right? And so, yes. and you know, I remember the Anti Defamation League stepping up um, when. Trump tried to do the Muslim ban and said, no, not on our watch, okay, and I love them for it. And when Jews are attacked, we stand up. When LGBTQ is attacked, we stand up. Black folks, white folks, it doesn't matter. We stand up, we fight for all of us. So thank you for sharing that audience, I love it. Is Nina on? I know we had a little technical issue. Um, okay, so um, Nina, um, I wanna ask you about the future. Uh, so, what you know? Look, we've had an amazing ride coming up to here, and I'm not asking about your future in particular. Um, I'm asking what a lot of people have in their mind right now, which is where do progressives, where do we in general go from here? Yeah, I mean, when we talk about that authenticity, and Dr. Richie is absolutely right. That authenticity is really about 
this movement being who it is. You know, I had an opportunity to speak to the Florida Progressive Democrats last weekend. And I said, if you're gonna comport yourself like the neoliberals and take progressive out your name, what the people of the great state of Florida need, especially in the face of a governor that is so wicked. And I don't agree with President Trump on much, but calling him de sanctimonious, he got that right. That you have to be totally different than the status quo Democrat. And if you're not gonna be different, then forget it. People need you to stand up for universal health care. They need you to stand up for workers rights. They need you to stand up for brutality in the legal system itself from top to bottom. They need you to be different. And if you're not gonna do that. So to me, the future of the progressive party, or progressive movement, is very much embedded in the future of America. Because as all three of us know, the majority of the American people, no matter how they identify, agree with the policy positions that the progressive movement is advocating for. And when you break it down so that Big Mama and Big Papa can understand it, it is about elevating people's quality of life. It is about changing material conditions. It is about ensuring that people make a living wage, that they can walk up and down their streets at night, that big mama and big papa don't have to worry about their babies getting shot walking up and down the street, that they don't have to worry about police brutality, that they don't have to worry about losing their jobs, that they don't have to worry about people with the power coming to crush them. And my God, if you live in East Palestine, Ohio, by way of example, that the government, both the state and federal government will have your back instead of their owner donors. This is what the progressive movement is about. It is about being a humanitarian, it's a humanitarian effort. That's exactly what it is. So the future is bright because it's about us. And we can't sit around and wait on people with fancy titles to change things. That has never been the reality in this country. And as we reflect right now on Black History Month, what better stories to 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 deepen our understanding of what it means to overcome the odds i mean not just the odds against you but that that it is sealed in your fate that generation after generation that after generation that you will be chattel in this country and black folks for first africans and then their descendants were able to transcend that in a mighty way. We still have many more miles to go, but you don't get a better example than that to hold that change will come when conscious minded people put a little extra on their ordinary and they defy the status quo, that that is when miracles happen. All right, well, we are out of time, but you can see there why you gotta watch On Boss with Nina Turner and Indisputable Dr. Rashad Ritchie. Uh, and uh, part of the reason we got to go is because Rashad now has 12 shows he's going to do in the rest of the day. And, <laughs> and he's going to get a two, probably an, on average two more degrees before the next Indisputable starts. We'll try. <laughs> All right. Wonderful Happy to have you guys. 21 years Thank old. You. Happy birthday. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to all of you as well. All right. We'll be right back. All right, back on the young his 21st birthday. Uh, Jake Huber, Michael Schur, J.R. Jackson with you guys. What's JR, up? J.R., of course, host of Watchlist, now the lead in for the Young Turks. So that's at 5 o'clock Eastern, 2 o'clock uh, Pacific. Michael Schur, as everybody remembers, of course, the host of the legendary program 2012. Right. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> when did that air? <laughs> oh, <laughs> 2012. It's been off the air for a long time. Um, yeah. It, it, it uh, wasn't was, supposed to be a shot. That was more of like what year that come out in because it was twenty. No, I, we know. Jeez, <laughs> I mean, make sure this isn't yeah. seen as any shots. Right. No, no. But uh, come to think of it, I'm not sure that show was built to last. Uh, given no, the it name didn't have twenty twelve. Well, it could have gone to twenty thirteen <laughs> because we had this great logo where TYT was in the middle of it. So it went yeah. twin TYT twelve, right? Yeah, so yeah. it could have gone twin. TYT her team. So yeah. it would have been. <laughs> but by 2014, by we would have been all been out dead. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. But we could have been, we could be going every year now, and you guys <laughs> haven't called me back for Oh, yeah. interesting. The I'm TYT is still in the, the middle. It was now. built for the 20s. It was yep. built for that now. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. What is new is, what is old is new. Right. Um, okay, so I'm going to read one comment here, and then we'll do, do our fun games. Um, so, first, thank you to everybody who uh, wrote in, who are members. On all the different platforms, and thank you to all the people who are being super generous on Super Chat. We appreciate it. 
And of course, you can join by hitting the join button below on YouTube. You know that tyt.com slash join. Um, and so um, Jesse Holbrook, Russell Pierce, William Thames, uh, thank you all for the well wishes and for the uh, generous donations. But TNTO wrote in, I randomly discovered TYT one evening in 2010. And although not American, I felt like I'd found my people. I'm now 50, when did that happen? And I'm still a devotee. Happy 21st, progressive forever, rock on, peace and love, Tish from Toronto. Uh, Tish, that's beautiful to hear. And then all these messages of people being with us from 2008, 2007, 2009, 2012, etc. Amazing, thank you. And we've kind of shared a life together. And uh, and so sometimes people come up and, and talk to me or hug me or whatever and say, I already know you, right? And that's not like, hey, I know you because you were an actor and and I think you did a great job playing Charles Manson. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you guys know us. This is how we actually are. Um, all right, so uh, now uh, let's go to uh, craziest moments that you experienced at TYT, JR. Oh, uh, I feel like I bring this up whenever we do have these things because it, it will stick, it'll stand every time. Uh, uh, one day, of course, on the weekend, we're trying to promote, do more for the show, everything. Uh, Jane goes, you know, you guys, I got a lot of work to do this weekend. You, Anna, and Jesus. Let's promote, we got some extra t-shirts in the back, let's promote. Go out in the streets, we're like, oh, we can paparazzi the paparazzi. We'll go up to Beverly Hills, because Jank always liked to go out and hang out where celebrities are and just maybe see where they are. And we said, we can do that without Jank. So we did it, and we found some paparazzi. Um, I didn't get along with one of them, and it ended a little badly. So let's watch. This is Anna Kasparian from The Young Turks, reporting live in Los Angeles. We're about to find some celebrities and some paparazzo and give away this gigantic thing of Young Turks t-shirts. We got red, we got blue, we got green. No, we don't have green. All right, we're going to find Lindsay Lohan. Are you guys ready? Are you ready? Are you excited? I'm ready to make this happen. <laughs> right behind me, directly behind me, there's a paparazzo from TMZ who refuses to let us interview him. We just want to give the mofo a shirt, but he won't even pay attention to us. JR is confronting him. There might be a blowout. <laughs> this is JR Jackson, live at the Ivy. Check this out. I've never been here before, but I'm very curious as to why the fence is so old and why it kind of looks like it's going to fall over. These are things that I've always wanted about, about nicer, rich places. People want to have old, raggedy things in their nice, new, ritzy, ditzy, $50 a plate places. I don't know. I've never been there, so I don't know what's $50 a plate. But when I come back up here, they're going to know who I am. I'm not going to tell them, look me in the eye. I'm going to be like, you know who the f I am? You know who I work for? TYT. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the Ivy is a place where a lot of the celebrities go in, in uh, LA historically. And so that's why paparazzi hang out by the Ivy, or as and I, I think I said paparazzo. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I've gone a couple of times, and uh, as I was, I forgot that it's just the Ivy and this paparazzi. Yeah. And paparazzi came up to me and interviewed me. Oh, yeah, I remember you yeah. That. And I was like, what? <laughs> that was like one of the first. I think it was probably the first time that someone interviewed me on the street, like I was famous. And they said, remember that guy, J.R. Jackson, who came up? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Here's what I want you to tell him. <laughs> I like that. Uh, I like the enthusiasm in that clip. Uh, I like that you got into a fight for no reason. Can we notice, uh, there was, this is not the second half, right? That's not coming. Because what happened was he threatened me. Um, and he was really short. He was about neck height. And I was like, you guys know how I think. I was like, I've got all these vulnerabilities open. I got my torso open. I got my throat open. And this guy's threatening me. So I was like, okay. And he's trying to be undercover because he's holding his glasses down. He says, don't put that camera on me. And he's cussing at me and everything. Because Jesus is across the street filming me interact with him. So he said he's going to go and do something to Jesus. And then so I blow up and I get all loud. And I was like, oh, you don't want attention. So I gave him a whole bunch of attention. So everyone can look. <laughs> There's this black guy screaming in the middle of Beverly Hills. And this guy is the reason. And okay. he ran off. So that guy was paparazzi? It was, I don't know if it was that particular, but the one I got into it was, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, get a load of that it's guy. It's ironic, right? That's yeah. the most ironic yeah. thing in the world. Yeah. Like, yeah. he's there to ambush celebrities, right. right? And give them attention that they didn't ask for and didn't want. 
But the minute you turn it on him, he's like, right. he's outraged. No, no, that's right. There was a guy <laughs> named Ron Galella in New York whose whole existence as a paparazzo, which is correct on Anna's part, mm -hmm. uh, was following Jackie Kennedy. That was everything yeah. he did, Jackie Onassis at, at that point. Yeah. Anytime anybody came up to him and gave him crap about it or took pictures of him stalking her, he would go bananas. It's the same thing that it's you weird. ran they into. Teach in, this in paparazzo in school? It, you know, yeah, <laughs> it's been such a long time. It was before 2012 that I went. So, <laughs> so and it's such a JR thing to be like, I got vulnerabilities. What if this short guy punches me in the throat? My torso's <laughs> open. <laughs> my my torso, neck's I'm, open. So. I would never even think that. No. It, I've been in a lot of fights when I was younger, and I never even thought that. Never get caught slipping. I've never been in a fight. There's a reason why. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Michael, how about you? Well, my torso was open. <laughs> um, I, but so a couple of things. I mean, there's sort of two different roles I've had here, both as you know, an anchor and a host, and you know, and uh, uh, jack of all trades, and then going out in the field. Uh, so I, I think one of the things that when you talk about craziest things, you, you meet people. And you talk to them, and you. What I the way I do it is just let them have the platform. I'm not. I'm not there to argue with them or to you know get in their faces. And uh, you're amazed at some of the things you hear, not just from the Trump people who like Trump and you can't understand why, perhaps, but it's the people that go a level deeper. And when you're presenting them with facts, I'm mean, thinking of one guy in Florida, and I, I don't think we have that, but this is an example of that, who was defending slavery to me days before election 2016. Long, long, he seemed like a smart guy, well thought out, well spoken. But defend, you know, the slaves had it pretty good, basically, was his premise. And that video did well, uh, you know, in, in the ways that videos do well here. And then recently I was out when, when the former president was doing his tour before the midterms. And I spoke to, an, it was another African American voter who came out to a Trump event. This one was in Michigan, I believe, and I think that's what we're going to show. Uh, who I gave him the, uh, we were talking about making America great again, and I pointed out that, you know, the again that they're talking about is like the times when there was Jim Crow. You set them up and they, they sell like in the 50s when, you know, but, but, you know, black people had to sit upstairs at the movie theater and all that. Anyway, he sort of, Thought that maybe going back to Jim Crow was good, if I remember. This is uh, this is one of those. Donald Trump about making America great, and he said back like in the fifties in the Eisenhower years uh, when you know it was post-war, a lot of construction, highway bill. But in the nineteen fifties, Black Americans had to sit upstairs in a in a in a movie theater and yeah, they couldn't sit in the same buses the south had jim crow laws that the the fighters and soldiers of the civil rights movement had to undo so it wasn't great for everybody i mean those were at that time those were the least of uh, our concerns at that time as black people we were all still want even united amongst each other but as you see now as time went on we're not anymore you know we have a very high rate of uh, a very high murder rate very high unemployment rate and things of that nature so since since that time blacks have actually our wealth has went down those things you can't uh, use the bathroom it was it's it's a new day now it is but he says make america great again and then he says like in the 50s and i'm saying america in the 50s yeah, not so great for everybody right i mean that that's that wouldn't seem like a bad thing to me. No. Going back, you know, as long as we keep the peace, I wouldn't mind everybody just. So if there was Jim Crow laws in the South, but there was peace and prosperity, you'd be okay with it? Yeah, they still had better uh, lives here than they did back in Africa. As slaves, they had better lives here. And there are some that would argue that. You can look that up. Their descendants, the descendants of those slaves, have much better lives here than the descendants of people who would have never gotten on those slave boats in Africa. And that's a provable fact, you know, because we have given them all those freedoms. It's I don't know how you fact. Do. It's a provable fact. I can't fact. do that. I was going to say the same thing. Provable fact. <laughs> uh, and my favorite from that crazy uh, slavery guy is, oh, you can look it up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I guess I could find your lunatic argument online as well. <laughs> that doesn't make it true. Um, yeah, he went on and on and on, and and then you know just the the idea that it wasn't it was the first guy when he said oh, th that was the least of their concern back then with, were Jim Crow laws. Yeah, right. I was okay. like, uh, yeah, man, no, I think it was pretty high on the yeah, list. It was, it was it was up pretty, there anyway. Yeah, it was, it was up, up there. there. You know, I guess agree with him. I'd say, I'd say the maybe the thing that they were concerned more about was the murder. 
uh, the murders, the lynchings, the lack of any kind of judicial recourse from those killings. Uh, you know, people getting maimed, taken from their families, all that type of stuff. Yeah. So I guess, I guess, sitting back the bus and uh, different water fountains and uh, uh, educational systems separate, all that stuff. Yeah. Secondary to the murder part. Right. I guess you yeah. want to go back to that part. You know, that's interesting, and that's part of why they did this. I don't want to get too too deep here. We're going to go ahead and do fun questions, but uh, why they're doing this attack against theoretically critical race theory? Because the closer we get to teaching actual history, the more uncomfortable it gets. Because when I was going to school. Um, we were taught about the Rosa Parks and the bus, because that's relatively benign, right? Like, but we weren't taught the lynchings. We weren't taught you light people on fire, you take pieces of their body home, right? We weren't taught those things. The closer you get to actually teaching things that really happened, then you begin, then people start to realize, oh, right, no, that was at the top of people's concerns, right? right. And so, um, but also when I was first learning about this stuff, not to age myself, you're learning it like ten years after it happened. <laughs> you know, like the the civil rights bill was the mid '60s, so it was even to anyone growing up in the '70s, '80s, '90s, it's pretty recent, right? It wasn't mm -hmm. just it wasn't like the American Revolution, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's a totally different thing. And these people who are younger than me, both of them. It, Still, though, it, it's been carried so long that people talk about it still in ways that, like you said, they didn't talk about it before. And with the horrors accentuated, and they don't really uh, seem to be faced by it at all. Yeah, all right, super last thing uh, on this. Um, what, like, so were you surprised by the Trump followers? I mean, because, you know, when you first start talking to them and doing those man on the street interviews and stuff, we didn't quite know the level of crazy yet right. at all, right. right? So do you remember thinking like, whoa, what is this? Yeah, it's sort of when you hear, when you because everybody's pretty nice to you, right? No matter mm -hmm. where you go, whether you're talking to Democrats or Republicans, crazies on either side, whatever it is, people are generally pretty nice. And then you get the camera on, then you're asking them these substantive questions. And it you start thinking, oh my God, this person's Freaking nuts, and I'm thinking in my head, I'm not saying it. I never, ever engage them. I just sort of, okay, and, and try and prod them, as you saw there, because that's the only way you get what you really need. And, and so I was definitely surprised. But, you know, if you think about it, though, half the country, first of all, they elected him. Half the country, you know, comes out to these concerts, uh, and, you know, where, where he goes around, or half the county when you're there uh, to see him, and they pick the places where they know they're going to get the people, so you know who's there. Um, so the surprise has waned, but at the beginning, absolutely. After the first debate that I saw him in, in Cleveland, Ohio, in 2015, People were on the street talking to me about Donald Trump and how uh, they thought he did pretty well. And I thought, what? You know, that was the Megyn Kelly diet. I was talking to some people here, Dave and Judith, about it before. That that was that was a shocking night. But people from the get go were like, oh, he's in, he's interesting. Yeah, no, they liked his, what they perceived to be his raw honesty. Yeah, it's an ironic honesty where he lies, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> but it appears honest because of how. Um, Authentic, it seems. Right. Authentic in that he's speaking off the top of his mind, not scripted, not talking points, etc. Yeah. And I think that's what resonated. But I remember I, I watched uh, one of your interviews, uh, and it was a, a this is the one that stuck in my mind. The guy was an accountant, and he sounded so reasonable until he started talking about politics. Mm -hmm. And he's like, "Oh no, of course, if Biden wins, we're going to move to Panama because <laughs> right. all of the riots are going to start and every city is going to burn." and Anyway, I got to go back to QuickBooks and you know do uh, Bobby's taxes here, but right now I'm like, it's what Bubba's is Bubba's taxes? Actually. Yeah, Bubba's. That's right. <laughs> Anyways, all right. So let's uh, have fun. Let's play this uh, game. Uh, we're gonna ask questions, and then uh, we're gonna see if we can get these Young Turks trivia basically right. Uh, question number one: Who called TYT the Young Turds? Mm -hmm. Was it Jimmy Dore, Laura Loomer, or Alex Jones? Kian Asmus Macho. You want this one? Okay. I I mean, do we get? Would you say one, two, three guests, so we don't? Uh, no, no, it's just okay. Just have it in your mind, yeah. okay? Okay, Faith have it in my mind, yeah. okay. Michael, go first. Alex Jones. Let's see, Alex Jones. Uh, I also have Alex Jones. What is the correct answer? I mean, I saw a video yesterday where the young turds uh, were saying that they are the number one internet news show. I mean, I'm on over 100 AM and FM stations, XM. But on the internet, just look at my website on Alexa compared to their website. Look at my videos, more views. I mean, you're full of crap. I'm number one. 
in alternative media, period, globally, even Rolling Stone, New York Magazine, all they've done actuaries, I'm number one. He's number one, period. Yeah. By the way, he's, here's one thing he's missing. It's a shirt. Yeah. I just <laughs> And then I showed numbers showing that, of course, he wasn't number one. Right. Well, New York Magazine said he was. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but he really is nuts. I mean, why did he do that video without a shirt? <laughs> Unbelievable. Okay. Talk about having your torso open. <laughs> indeed, indeed. All right, uh, let's go to question number two. Who called JR oh, JJR? Man. A disgruntled Bulgarian viewer, Pastor James David Manning, a random caller on a TYT voicemail. I will always. I have my this. answer. Yes, I definitely have the answer. Uh, I mean, I, this is one that, that you guys have more information on than I do. I'm going to go with the caller, uh, Pastor James David Manning. He, Manning. Would, he wouldn't have been in there. Actually, it was a terrible answer. But he wouldn't have been in there specifically among two r vague random things. Yeah, were it not him. It so, you know, the other answer I would have put in is Roland Martin because you guys beefed. <laughs> Do you remember when you were beefing with Roland Martin? It was Martin quite a short beef over. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was in Santorum. Yeah, it was a Rick Santorum. Rick yeah, Santorum. and by the way, uh, Roland Martin now part of the TRT network on Facebook. No. Okay. Uh, so let's watch this group, the Young Turks. Well, who are they anyway? I mean, are they? Are they people from Turkey or are they some sort of a street gang? I mean, I've never heard, you know, I don't even, this is a guy's name, I think his name is Sink Uger. You know, I, what kind of name is that anyway? I mean, where, where is he, where was he born? Was he born in the, in the Baltic somewhere, Bosnia? This guy, JR, let me say a word about him. I don't know where he got his name, JR Jackson, he's, he's, he's this guy. Uh, Jinx Tonto. You so said you call Jinx the Long Ranger. This guy J Jar, call him Tonto. But let me go back to this guy J Jar. I see he's got all that them dreadlocks in his hair. I said, well, you know, you know what, you know what? Can I tell you something about black men that wear dreadlocks? They are. Uh, they want people to think they're bad. That's the first time I'd heard that uh, that assumption about. Guys who wear dreads. Usually it's that they smoke too much weed. But that's always the number one thing. But then after that, then it goes to well, money. They're bad. Well, <laughs> Pastor Manning, of course, had a lot of novel theories. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the, the most legendary one that he came and actually shared on the show. Man, we we right. had him on the show oh. he, and, he, and oh. he said it. He, he's the guy who said Starbucks is trying to turn everybody gay uh, the, and they're putting semen in the coffee uh, wow. because that makes it so much more delicious. Hmm. And I was like, does it? <laughs> Long like he, Mac definitely, Daddy. he definitely made his coffee in the morning with, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's missing a little something, a little wow. extra pizzazz. Okay. Hun, I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Him. So we had him on and we asked him, really? I mean, do you think that? He's yeah. like, well, obviously. No. It's like, well, wouldn't that make it taste better? And so, so he was, of course, a conservative pastor, and but but all, with all these guys, whether it's Phil Davidson or uh, Pastor Manning, I think whatever happened to them, right? True. Well, that's true, right? Yeah. yeah. So I, uh, I think I saw him in the news the other yeah, day, but I can't I like remember it. Recently. Really? Yeah. 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 But I worry. We'll look it up. Maybe but. he was right. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe they're like, oh, you know, it turns out. So it's yeah, pastor. that's why they're doing the labor movement at Starbucks. Exactly. No, all right, no. Okay, uh, all right. Question number three: Which of these wrong predictions was said by Jenk on air? Wait a minute. Mm. Tucker Carlson's Fox News show will have lower will have low viewership. Trump will not run for president in 2024. The Steelers will win the 2011 Super Bowl. Which of those wrong predictions? Yeah, I have all my answer. three. Be. <laughs> I have my answer. You guys have the answer. Only I can remember which Super Bowl the Steelers won. That would make that would Tucker, totally help me eliminate Steelers. And what was the? Oh, Trump will not run. Um, I think it was Trump will not run. I'm going with Tucker. I'm going with the Steelers. Let's find out. Guess who's back? Tucker Carlson. He's been hired as a television host again. How is that possible? <laughs> the man had. The worst ratings possibly in cable news history. Everywhere he's gone, at CNN, at MSNBC, his shows have done disastrously, proven over and over again that he's a complete and colossal failure. Now, I saw the ratings when he was on MSNBC. 
it was hideous. It was our YouTube channel was would crush his ratings, and he's on freaking television. So of course he's now recycled again. Guess where he's going? Fox News Channel. But I'm glad they hired Tucker Carlson because the only thing Tucker can do is destroy Fox News ratings. So if anyone can fail on Fox News, it's Tucker Carlson. That was that was the first time. That was that was. The, his first go round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that was not the prime time show yet. Uh, and right. so, to be fair to me, I think in the first go around, his ratings did suck. They did. Uh, they, I think they did at that time. Yeah. yeah. And he wasn't the worst rated because the worst rated show, I believe, especially at that time, I'm sure it was in cable TV, was the hosted show was John McEnroe had a show on did MSNBC you? at night oh, I that I think is known okay. as the worst rated show in cable. Don't worry, they, John. Uh, they're catching up to you now because <laughs> the numbers are diving so much. Okay, so but uh, I didn't remember that at all. Obviously, I got I got the answer wrong, even though it was me. Uh, but uh, another, to be fair to me, uh, the, all those facts were right. And and the reason that that Tucker started doing great now is because he pivoted, and he pivoted from the bow tie and being an elitist, that which is that he yeah. was like known as like the guy who was. The most establishment, the most mainstream in a lot of ways. That's why he fit in at CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News. He had no, didn't seem to have any guiding principles, right? And but when he made the turn, and that's why it's interesting, and became like a, a populist in his own, in the right wing way, which is right. like, oh, you got to suntan your testicles <laughs> to get be smarter and mm -hmm. make up all these things. It is literally a strategy, and so. It's the least authentic thing you have ever seen. Tucker wasn't like that at all. He just turned on a dime based on strategy. But nonetheless, a spectacularly wrong prediction. <laughs> okay, so let's be fair about that. Uh, all right, question number four. Which viral dance did the uh, TYT office do for a video? Macarena, Cha Cha Slide, Harlem Shake. I know this one I know for it sure. It's, it's, yeah, just, yes, pretty I know it's, it's when I discovered I was. Uh, I was gaining too much weight, and I was like, this has to change. I saw myself on camera, and I was like, who is that? Okay, we're about to see it. I can't go first every time, I learned. <laughs> no, yeah. but we know, we know which one it yes. is. Well, that's why I can't go first. <laughs> uh, the, uh, well, Macarena was too early, so I think it's the, what, what is the cha-cha slide and the other one? Yeah, Harlem, Harlem Shake. Harlem Shake, I think it's the, uh, I think it's the uh, cha-cha slide. All right, uh, let's see. It's a harm shit. Of course. It's hard to yeah. tell who you, uh, who's my favorite in that video. Yeah. Dave Kohler, John I roll a bare feet there. That was weird. Uh, That's definitely the answer. Can I answer that? It's Dave Kohler. Yeah, <laughs> Dave Kohler. Was that L right in the middle? That's, that was L right totally in the middle. outside yeah, what I would have yeah. thought she would do. Yeah. Right in the middle of the whole scene. With John doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, if you go to tyt.com slash cheers and you're drinking along with us, uh, you'll see all of our favorite drinks. And, at the, and Dave's is at the end, and it's carrot juice. <laughs> Fresh can just like right through the An juice email went out asking what your favorite drink is. And yeah, you know, your favorite cocktail, I think it was. And yeah, know. and he's like, well, our character. Well, we had three or four <laughs> hosts and, and contributors and folks that absolutely flubbed that answer, gave me apple juice, carrot juice, and cranberry juice. Come on, you guys. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys, we got to go. Uh, so check out Watch List. It's at 5 o'clock Eastern. Uh, and uh, But uh, hold on. Uh, uh, members, you got a bonus episode, extra birthday present for you guys. So Michael's gonna say Dave, the legendary Dave Kohler is gonna come and join us. And we haven't yet gotten to the craziest video in TYT history. Michael picked it and he's correct, we all agree. Mm -hmm. uh, and we did a poll of you guys asking what was your favorite uh, TYT moment of all time. <laughs> it will be revealed in the bonus episode. So if you're on YouTube, hit the join button below the video. Uh, if you're on the cell phones, you gotta scroll down a little bit. Uh, and uh, everyone else, tyt.com slash join. Come join us, we'll have a little bit more fun tonight. Right back. It began on the internet. 
a new show that redefined hard news. Progressive politics with an edge. These are the Young Turks. Jesus Godoy. J.R. Jackson. Dave Kohler. Anna Kasparian. And Jen Huger as the host. Oh, Dave. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to tell a really stupid little story. Oh, that's oh, awesome! That's so <laughs> okay, hold on. No, 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 no. no. I like that one. <laughs> no, there you go. <laughs> okay, all right. So I went to the supermarket this weekend, and these two women who looked just like Kardashian sisters got out of a car. They were, like, way ahead, other side of the parking lot for me. And I said, that might be them. It was in Beverly Hills. And so I walked to the car. I saw eh, the car was a Toyota. Ah, oh, forget so, it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I went into the supermarket, I, but I still had doubts. So I went up to her and I said, are you two of the Kardashian sisters? And she said, no. Oh. And I said, all right, well, thank you. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I like that so much. <laughs> that's awesome. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Young Turks. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, Cenk Uger, and I'll see you soon.